The Ascendant Quran, Realigning Man to the Divine Power Culture. The first ever tafsir written directly in English by one of the best known Quran scholars in North America, Imam Muhammad Al Asi. Three volumes of this multi volume tafsir are now available from Crescent International at a special price of $40 per volume, including shipping anywhere in North America. The Noble Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is revered and loved by all Muslims, but there is one aspect of his blessed life that is not well known, and that is the treaties he entered into as well as the letters he wrote to kings and rulers of neighboring countries. For the first time this book, Power Manifestations of the Sirah, examining the letters and treaties of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam discusses this crucial topic in detail. The book is now available at a special price of $30 including shipping and handling anywhere in North America. Order from Crescent International, PO Box 747, Gormley, Ontario, L0H1G0, or call us 905-887-8913. Order your copy today. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Afifa Khawaja and welcome to Muslim Perspectives. On November 8th, the International Atomic Energy Agency released its report on Iran's nuclear program. It was preceded by weeks of speculation that Iran was making a bomb and that this latest report would provide conclusive proof. Iran not only denies making the bomb, but condemned the report as being politically motivated. What's the truth? To help us understand this, we have Brother Zafar Bangesh on our program. Welcome to the program, Brother Zafar. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. The Atomic Energy Agency says that Iran is making the bomb. Iran denies it, and you've covered this issue in the Crescent magazine for several years. What's your take on the problem? Well, obviously, um, my understanding is that uh, Iran is not making the bomb. Uh, it is, of course, entitled to enrich uranium, but uh, because its uh, leaders have said that they're not making the bomb, and uh, no evidence has been found that it is making the bomb, so I say that they are not making the bomb. But the report does make some very strong allegations. Do you think that they're politically motivated? Oh, absolutely. They definitely are politically motivated. Why exactly would you say that? Well, you see, if we consider the latest report by the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was released on November the 8th, uh, and we compare this report with the report that was released by this agency as far back as 2003. Uh, in that report, the same agency, but headed by a different person, Dr. Muhammad al Barade, uh, that report of 2003 had exclusively and explicitly stated that they had found absolutely no evidence that uh, Iran was making the bomb or that no uh, material had been diverted from uh, its uh, appropriate use towards unauthorized use. Now, this report, interestingly, confirms that, but then it goes on to make this uh, absolutely ludicrous allegation to say that, well, we haven't found any proof that the, the work that Iran is doing openly that they have diverted any uh, enriched uranium from there towards any unauthorized use, but we don't know whether Iran is doing something secretly. You see, so when you look at it, when, when they start talking in terms of uh, doing something secretly, then the question arises, uh, what do you mean? If it's something secret, how did you get to know about it? Okay. Also, there are other very serious concerns uh, that I have with respect to why the agency's report is politicized. More particularly, its director general, uh, Yukiya Amano, who, is, uh, who was the former, uh, formerly a Japanese diplomat, um, we have evidence now through WikiLeaks that were released in uh, 2009 uh, the top U.S. diplomat in Vienna by the name of Jeffrey Peart, in a secret cable that he had sent to the State Department in July of 2009, just at the time when um, Amano had just been designated the new Director General, although he had not taken over, uh, Peart actually in that uh, cable, secret cable to the State Department, says that uh, Amano is our man. 
he will do what we tell him. And then there's another cable in, 2000 and, uh, in October of 2009, in which uh, Piet says that we have had a detailed meeting with Amano, and uh, although he may represent uh, the member uh, states of uh, the agency, but essentially he will do what we tell him to do. And we have this opportunity to influence his thinking. And there's even more damning evidence in the sense that uh, on October the 28th, uh, 12 days before the agency released its report, uh, Amano secretly went to the White House and he met members of the U.S. National Security Council. Now, you see the International Atomic Energy Agency and its Director General are supposed to represent the member states, not any particular country, uh, but certainly not to be going and secretly visiting members of the United States National Security Council. I mean, why was it there? The White House uh, refused to answer this question, but this was revealed by the New York Times on November the 7th in its report. So you see that Amano himself is a very controversial figure, and most observers believe that he is acting at the behest of the U.S., and that does not uh, bode well for the agency's future, as well as, uh, uh, you know, it, its reports cannot have any credibility when you have a situation like that. But the report does say that Iran has not responded to its letter of October 12th to allow agency inspectors to visit Iran's heavy water plant. If Iran has nothing to hide, why won't they allow them access? Well, that's a very good question. But you see, here, perhaps somebody who is not familiar with uh, the uh, rules and regulations of the agency as well as the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, they would think that there is something really suspicious, why doesn't Iran allow its heavy water plant to be uh, open for inspection? The fact is that according to scientific data, heavy water is not considered part of uh, nuclear enriched material, number one. Secondly, Iran does not have a uh, heavy water plant that it's operating. The agency itself says that it will become operational at the end of 2013. So heavy water is not covered by the NPT. So something that is not covered by the NPT, when the agency makes a demand of Iran that it should make its heavy water uh, you know, processing plant or whatever for inspection, then the agency itself is going beyond its mandate and it is deliberately trying to mislead people because an average person wouldn't know what's the difference between heavy water and enriched uranium. So that is how, you know, when I say that the agency has politicized itself and it is acting on behalf of the U.S., this is another additional proof that, you know, look, when, when uh, Iran is not obliged under any circumstances to open its uh, heavy water operations for the agency's inspections, for the agency to make uh, that demand, obviously, is going beyond its own mandate, and it definitely is a political uh, move, and it is to confuse people that would not ordinarily know about it. What is the NPT, and how does it work? Good. I'm glad that you asked this question because um, a lot of people obviously are, are not really fully uh, familiar with the NPT. The NPT stands for Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, and it first came into effect in 1968. Now, the NPT basically is uh, tasked with making sure that uh, nuclear weapons do not proliferate in the world, and that um, uh, the countries that have nuclear weapons under the NPT are supposed to uh, reduce their nuclear weapons. So to give you an example, in 1995, the NPT, I mean, every 10 years it has its, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, conference or a conference of each decade. In 1995, there was actually an NPT conference at the United Nations at which it was agreed that both the U.S., and Russia will have to reduce their nuclear weapons drastically. I mean, you know, for instance, at that time, uh, Russia and, and, and America had nuclear weapons to the tune of something like uh, 25 to 30,000 nuclear warheads, wow. each country. And in fact, there was a, a, a term that was coined, which was referred to as mutually assured destruction. And the abbreviation of that is MAD. And it is absolutely MAD that 
somebody, each one country would have 30,000 nuclear weapons when in fact only two or three nuclear weapons are enough to, to wipe out you know, much of the world. So for one country like the U.S. to have 30,000 weapons, Russia to have an equivalent number of 30,000 weapons, etc., this is insane. This is truly mad. But in any case, the, the NPT treaty, actually the, the, their conference in 1995 said that both Russia and America must reduce their weapons uh, you know, and bring them down completely to zero. That's in fact what they had said, that there should be no need for any weapons. And the other countries that were not nuclear weapon states, they then agreed that if America and Russia and other nuclear powers were to reduce their weapons and they would not produce new generation of weapons, then those countries would not acquire nuclear weapons. But what happened? Ten years later, in 2005, when there was another uh, conference of NPT at the United Nations, neither America nor Russia had complied with their requirements. They didn't do that. And in fact, the only thing they were doing was demanding other countries that they should comply with U.S. and Western demands that they should not have, uh, not, not do any nuclear research or not produce any weapons, etc. So you see that um, instead of uh, America and Russia living up to their obligations, they simply use uh, the, the agency, the International Atomic Energy Agency, as well as the NPT, to exert pressure on other countries rather than to uh, comply with their own obligations. So, regrettably, what Russia and, and America have done is uh, to produce more lethal weapons, and although they did reduce some of their weapons, but these were very, very old weapons of the 60s and so on, uh, whose um, lethal uh, capacity was, was uh, degraded in any case. But now they have produced new generation weapons which are much more lethal and therefore much more dangerous for the world. Is Iran a signatory to the NPT? Oh yes, of course. Uh, Iran is a signatory to the NPT and so far nobody has been able to prove, apart from these allegations that are being made against Iran, that it has at any time violated its obligations under the NPT. But I want to point out something else. You know, Israel is not a signatory to the NPT, and it is well known that Israel has anything from 200 to 500 nuclear weapons. In September of 2009, uh, the uh, NPT uh, or, or the agency, the International Atomic Energy Agency Board of Governors, uh, when they met in Vienna, they made a demand of Israel that it should open its nuclear facilities for international inspection. You know what the, what the Israeli representative and the American representative said? I they can said, only imagine. They said it's, it's, it's unfair, it is only targeting Israel. Imagine, Iran is a signatory, it has opened its facilities to international inspection, and yet they keep on making these allegations against Iran, but they don't want to even mention the nuclear weapons that Israel has. So you see, these are the kinds of uh, difficulties that, that we are facing. So what exactly are Iran's obligations and what is it entitled to under the NPT? Well, obviously, uh, Iran's obligations under the NPT are that it should not be making nuclear weapons, number one. Uh, secondly, that it should allow reasonable inspections of its facilities. Uh, but at the other end of the scale, under the NPT, uh, other members of the NPT are obliged to help Iran to enrich uranium. Mm -hmm. They're to, to help it technically. Because you know, the, the very basis of the, uh, the establishment of the agency was that, they, uh, that uh, it, it was actually called um, Atoms for Peace. So for peaceful purposes, uh, uh, Iran should be actually helped by NPT uh, signatory members. So what, what, what we find is instead of helping Iran, they're actually targeting Iran unfairly. And that is why this whole crisis has emerged. Why does an oil and gas rich country like Iran need nuclear energy? Well, that's a good question. You see, uh, the point is that although Iran is a, an oil and gas country, a rich country, but um, regrettably, it does not have uh, enough refining capacity. And because of its growing population, there is tremendous, of course, there is tremendous demand for, for oil in, in Iran itself. And so it needs alternate sources of energy. That's number one. Secondly, I think we need to understand that, uh, you know, enriched uranium is not simply used for making bombs. 
I mean, just like if somebody goes to buy steel, it does not necessarily mean that somebody wants to make a gun out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are other uses for making steel as well, uh, or using steel. Uh, similarly, enriched uranium is used in medical facilities, in nuclear, uh, making nuclear isotopes for research, uh, etc. So, Iran has a legitimate need like any other country. I mean, for instance, you know, there are literally hundreds of countries in the world that have nuclear reactors that are producing energy, electricity, and also making uh, nuclear isotopes for research, etc. So in that sense, um, uh, Iran is acting no different than any other country in the world. How many countries have nuclear weapons and how many of them are subjected to the same degree of inspection as Iran is? Well, uh, you know, we know of um, seven countries that have admitted that they have nuclear weapons. Of course, I'll num name them for you, the United States, Russia, Britain, um, uh, uh, France, and China on one hand. These were the five nuclear states. Then, of course, uh, India and Pakistan, they have now declared that they have nuclear weapons. But the, the, the eighth, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Israel, also is a nuclear state and it has nuclear weapons. So. Seven countries in the world are declared, that means these countries and their governments openly admit that they have nuclear weapons. Israel has nuclear weapons, but it refuses to admit. Then there are other countries that are on the threshold. If they want, they can get nuclear weapons very quickly. I mean, Canada is one of them, for instance. Sweden is another. Uh, you know, Brazil is another. Uh, there are a number of, Japan is another. There are a number of other countries. In addition, the question that you asked, I think which is, it is very important, that of all the countries in the world that are members of the NPT, Iran is the only one that is subjected to these, uh, these intrusive inspections, repeated demands being made on Iran that it should open its facilities. It is the only one that is being targeted. Nobody else. I mean, nobody would even think about targeting uh, any other country, and yet it is Iran that is being targeted in this vicious manner. Why doesn't Iran take some confidence-building measures to allay Western fears? Well, you know, uh, Iran actually has done that several times. For instance, I'll give you some examples. From 2003 to 2005, I mean, prior to that, of course, there were negotiations with various countries uh, of, of uh, the agency. So finally, Iran agreed to stop enriching uranium on, in 2003. But there was there were certain Iranian conditions as well. They said that, look, we are going to stop enriching uranium to show to you that we are sincere in our negotiations. But what you have to do is to lift the sanctions that you have imposed on us. So for two years, the West, which were led by, you know, the United States, but Britain, France, etc., they just dragged their feet and they would not lift the sanctions that were imposed on Iran. So in 2005, Iran said, and no, in addition, one other point I think is very important, that Iran allowed extensive uh, monitoring of its nuclear facilities, like, you know, additional cameras were installed. In other words, Iran was under 24-7 uh, agency supervision. And many of the, the inspectors of the, the, the nuclear agency were actually, you know, regrettably, they were acting as spies for America or, or Israel, etc. Even to that extent, when Iran went and opened its facilities for two years, the sanctions against Iran were not lifted. So in 2005, Iran turned around and he said, well, look, if you, the agreement was that we will stop uranium enrichment, we will provide you additional, uh, you know, there was what was referred to as the additional protocol, that means additional inspection. We allowed you all of that, and yet you have not lifted these sanctions. So why should we continue with allowing you unfettered uh, access? Why should we adhere to enriching uranium when we are entitled under the NPT to enrich uranium? So that was one aspect which the West actually violated. Last year, Iran had proposed that, okay, uh, here is our proposal. We have enriched uranium to 3.5%. You see, 3.5% is nominal. Uh, by the time you get to nuclear grade, you have to be obviously much more, but uh, you have to go beyond the 20% enrichment of uranium, but actually to make sort of, you know, absolute bomb material, you require actually 95% enriched uranium. So Iran made another proposal. They said, we are prepared to hand over all of our enriched uranium, which is up to 3.5%, 
we will give it to Turkey. At the same time, you give us uh, material, fuel, which is 20% enriched, which, you, which is used in medical uh, experiments for our medical purposes. But the swap must take, simul take place simultaneously. That means that Iran said, we're not going to give you, uh, you know, several tons of 3.5% enriched uranium, and then you just take it and run away with it. That means that years and years of work that we have done in producing this 3.5%, you take it away and we are left with nothing. Right. The West refused. Now you see, every step of the way, Iran has gone forward to offer alternate proposals. And it has even, uh, step by step, refuted the allegations that, that the, uh, the, the agency has made or America has made. And yet, obviously, as I said in the beginning, this whole issue is politicized. It is not really meant to arrive at a solution. Uh, that's why no matter what confidence-building measures Iran proposes, uh, you know, the West is not uh, interested in, in accepting those. There is speculation that Israel and the U.S. might attack Iran. What's your take on this? Uh, well, you know, just look at this, um, uh, this, this scenario. Uh, here we have the world in which uh, America makes all this you know, noise about war on terror, etc., just because someone, they think that somebody might threaten them. And here America and Israel are actually threatening war. And they are saying that they want to go and bomb uh, Iran's nuclear facilities. I mean, this is not only insane, I would say that this is a war crime. And yet, you know, imagine, look at, look at the, the, the media over here, look at politicians in this country or any other country. They think that this is perfectly, you know, legitimate. As if this is just a normal thing to do, that you go and bomb another country. Like, you know, we see the consequences of what America has done in Afghanistan and in Iraq, killing tens of thousands, if not millions of people, and yet nowhere near achieving anything. So if there is a war, let me tell you what will happen. Uh, Iran obviously would have to defend itself. How would it do it? It will uh, close the Strait of Hormuz. Oil is stopped. Uh, oil prices shoot up to $200, $300 a barrel with the U.S. economy already in the pits, uh, Western economies down the tube. Imagine what would happen to the global economy. So I would say that it would be absolute madness to actually attack Iran uh, because of these allegations. What has been the reaction of countries like Russia and China to this uh, scenario? Well, both uh, Russia and China have actually um, rejected the war option. Uh, in fact, uh, Russia has said that the, N the, the agency report is politicized. Uh, China has even gone to the extent to say that there should be no sanctions against Iran, no further sanctions. In fact, uh, this whole process uh, ought to be, or this issue ought to be um, negotiated and Iran needs to be engaged in a dialogue rather than issuing threats. Suppose there is a war, what scenario do you see? Well, uh, you know, as I said earlier, Iran definitely would uh, close the Strait of Hormuz. Um, it would, uh, that means that there will be no oil flowing to the West. And Iran has the capacity to uh, basically target um, uh, U.S. Uh, allied countries in the region, including Israel. You know, Iranian commanders have said that if we are attacked, we are going to attack Israel and fire more than a thousand um, missiles at uh, Israel's uh, Dimona nuclear reactor. So I think if that were to happen, I personally think that we'll, we'll really be into the Third World War. There will be just absolute chaos. The whole region, the whole Middle Eastern region would go up in flames. And um, far from achieving their objectives, in fact, America and Israel would have um, really set the world on fire. And that would be a total disaster for the whole of mankind. Why is Iran being targeted in this manner? Well, that's a good question. I think the real reason for that is that uh, Iran wishes to remain independent, that it wishes to pursue its own independent policies. It is not prepared to take any dictation from the U.S. You know, here is the irony. As far back as 1977, it was the U.S. that offered to Iran, at that time, of course, Iran was uh, ruled by the Shah, who was an American puppet. It was the U.S. that offered to Iran nuclear reactors and proposed to Iran that it should embark upon uh, you know, making nuclear weapons. When the Islamic Revolution occurred in Iran in 79, Iran stopped that whole, that whole agreement and said, we don't want to continue with that process. So America was the one that, that actually wanted Iran under the Shah to have nuclear weapons, but 
an independent Iran wishes to pursue peaceful nuclear activities and the U.S. is not prepared to, to allow it to do so. What do you think will or should happen in this situation? Well, I think uh, the important thing is that uh, there should be uh, discussions and dialogue, but honest dialogue. I mean, Iran has constantly called for an honest dialogue on this issue. They are open to that discussion. But they said that we need to do it on the basis of mutual respect. Don't come and make demands of us and say, you do this or you do that. Well, we are not obliged to do that under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, in fact, uh, Iran has uh, responded to these allegations in a detailed manner, clarifying its position. And although, you know, America and its allies uh, will try various means to um, isolate Iran to impose additional sanctions, but I don't think that there is much that they can do. I think the way to resolve this issue would be to sit with Iran, to negotiate the things as Iran has insisted on the basis of mutual respect. If there is that aspect of mutual respect, I'm confident that this issue can be resolved. And how should Iran deal with this situation? Well, uh, I think the, the, the first thing is that um, obviously Iran needs to uh, respond to these allegations. As I said, they have done that. They should do more and they should also put forward uh, their point of view to their friendly countries, particularly to countries like China and Russia, and, and bring them on board. And um, uh, at the same time, uh, that they should uh, engage these countries in, in proper dialogue and uh, try to impress upon them that uh, this whole uh, scenario of war and threats and sanctions, etc., is not going to get them get the West anywhere. And that I think they should uh, quit uh, acting like bullies uh, because it will be to their detriment if they continue to behave in this manner. Should countries, any country, really have nuclear weapons? Well, the simple answer is no, absolutely not. These are terrible, terrible weapons. Uh, you know, uh, I think it is very unfair. I mean, we, we know the consequences of countries uh, with nuclear weapons. I mean, you know, we, um, of course, we weren't uh, around at that time, but the U.S. used nuclear weapons against Japan in Nagasaki, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and, and the consequences were catastrophic. Today, of course, these nuclear weapons have become far more lethal. So imagine, you know, what would happen. I mean, there will be terrible, terrible consequences, unless somebody is absolutely mad and they want to destroy the world. So I would say no, no country should have nuclear weapons. But I will qualify that to say if some countries are going to have nuclear weapons, as, you know, the they five permanent members of the Security Council and India and Pakistan and Israel, then I think the whole, everybody should have nuclear weapons. Why should some countries have the right to blackmail others? I think the only way, like, you know, when we look around the world, countries that have nuclear weapons have not been threatened. For instance, North Korea can behave as badly as it wants, but just because it has nuclear weapons, America has not dared to attack it. Mm -hmm. Iraq had already abandoned its you know, weapons of mass destruction. That's why it, wa it was attacked. Libya gave up its nuclear program. That's why it was attacked and, and destroyed. You know, America is trying to undermine Pakistan, but it cannot attack it directly because Pakistan has nuclear weapons. So when countries have nuclear weapons, then the West is much more careful. If Israel can have nuclear weapons, why not anybody else? So I would say the short answer is either no nuclear weapons or everybody should have them so that nobody would dare to attack somebody else. We have come to the end of our program. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us, Brother Zephyr, on this uh, very interesting and scary topic. Thank you to our viewers for watching Muslim Perspectives. We're glad you could join us. Please make sure that you come back next week, same time, same channel. For Muslim Perspectives, I'm Afifa Kawaja. Thank <laughs> you.